Has anyone here heard of Quitter's Day? I hadn't heard of it either until a few days ago. When I first th heard about it, I thought, oh, great, now we're, what, celebrating quitters? Oh, I just quit my job. Hey, good for you, what? right? Then I thought, no, okay, that's probably not it, and it wasn't. Then I thought, okay, you know, this is probably some noble effort, right, to, to celebrate and support and encourage people who are, are maybe quitting addictive or destructive or, you know, harmful behaviors. Not it either. Turns out Quitter's Day got its start because so many people who start out the new year making resolutions fail so quickly to keep those resolutions that somebody said, you know what, we really ought to have a do-over day. And so Quitter's Day is January, or it's the second Friday of January, apparently, and everybody's encouraged to, you know, take another stab at that resolution that you made and already failed at. So I thought, oh, well, that's actually kind of clever, I thought. But then I did some more research, and I found out that researchers tell us that of all the people in the United States who make New Year's resolutions, you want to guess how many people actually follow through and keep those resolutions? in the single digits. That's, that's, those are pretty bleak numbers, aren't they? You know? So even with the quitter's day, it just doesn't happen more often than not. You know what that tells me? It tells me that change is hard. But you already know that, right? I mean, if you've tried to change a bad habit, or if you've tried to adopt a new healthy, more positive habit, you know it's, it's hard. It just doesn't come easy. It's difficult. And so, I mean, you can even look to somebody like the Apostle Paul. He said, and I'm going to paraphrase, he said, you know, the good things that I resolve to do, yeah, I, I don't do those things. And you know the evil that I don't want to do, that I've resolved to leave behind me? Yeah, well, those are the things that I do. So if somebody like the Apostle Paul struggles with change and improving improvements in his life, then, then what hope is there for mere mortals like us, right? Well, it turns out there's, there's lots to be hopeful for. And so as we look forward to this coming year, I'd say let's take a look at the book of Ecclesiastes and see what help there is for us mere mortals in making changes in this, this new year. So we're going to look at the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, the, most scholars believe that Solomon is the author. He's not named in the book, but most people believe that it is so Solomon who is behind the writings uh, and the thoughts and the wisdom of the book of Ecclesiastes. The main character is known as the teacher. And there's a lot we can learn from the teacher. Maybe you haven't spent a lot of time in Ecclesiastes. It's an awesome book. It's a great book. It is filled with unbelievable wisdom. But today we're going to look at uh, a portion that talks about change. Now, the teacher says, and, and this is a main theme, this main idea in the entire book of Ecclesiastes, the teacher said, you know, I'm going to wrestle with some of these big issues in life. I, I want to find out and understand what the real meaning and purpose of life is. And he said, but, and this is key, he looked to find meaning and purpose in life in things apart from God. And so, with predictable results, but he said, you know, maybe, maybe the purpose of life, maybe the meaning of life is to amass as much wealth as you possibly can and then enjoy the fruits of your labor and live the life that wealth affords you. Or maybe, maybe the purpose of life is simply to just enjoy all the pleasures that this world has to offer. Maybe there's nothing better than to just, you know, look for pleasure and enjoyment in life. Or maybe, he thought, 
Maybe the meaning and purpose of life is to gain power and then wield that power to your own ends. Or maybe, maybe the purpose of life is simply to just gain and amass knowledge. And so in Ecclesiastes, the teacher did all of those things. He amassed great wealth. He indulged every pleasure. He gained power. He gained incredible wisdom. And you know what he said at the end of all that? I have seen all the things done under the sun. All of them are meaningless. A chasing after the wind. Hmm. He came to realize that in a life lived apart from God, all this stuff we chase after, it's all meaningless. It's all, it's all a waste of time. It's all useless. A, a chasing after the wind. I like that. That really kind of captures it, doesn't it? And so the teacher here is uniquely qualified to help us as we look forward to a new year, as we look to strive for improvement, to make changes. He's uniquely qualified to help us go from living a life that is meaningless to a life that is full of meaning. To set aside things that are useless and become useful in this world. To stop chasing after the wind and start chasing things that really matter. And so we're going to let the teacher help us do that this morning. And really, isn't that what you know, resolutions are all about? Becoming, finding meaning and purpose in our lives, right? So, what changes would you like to see in your life this, this coming year? If you're being brutally honest with yourself, what changes do you need to make in this coming year? All of our situations are different. We all live in different circumstances. We all maybe struggle with different things. We have different strengths, different weaknesses. So I'm not going to try to get super specific to everybody, but be more generic. Let's just say that as we look forward to the coming year, let's say that we all want to have a closer walk with God, to grow as his disciples, to grow in understanding, to grow in love. Let's say that we want to take to heart what Jesus said when he said that we shall let our light shine before others that others might see our good deeds and praise our Father in heaven. Let's say that that's our goal, that we want to make changes along those lines, right? Well, If we all agree that those changes are good and positive and maybe even necessary, why is it so hard to follow through on them? You know, why, why is it so hard? If we all agree and know that it's a good thing to do, then why is it so hard? Well, there's a lot of reasons for that, and we're going to talk about some of them. The first is one that you know, you hear every single Sunday. You hear it over and over again. We know it. One of the reasons that change, especially the changes that God calls us to make, one of the reasons that those changes are so, are so hard for us is because we're broken. We're broken in a way that we can't fix. We're broken by sin, right? Paul writes in, his, in one of his letters, he said, the mind governed by the flesh, that is a sinful human nature, the mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's lot, nor can it do so. One of the reasons change, positive change in our lives, doing the things that God calls us to do and, and being the people that God calls us to be, one of the reasons that's so hard is that our sinful human nature makes it impossible by ourselves. We're never going to be better followers of Jesus simply by trying really, really hard to follow harder. It's not going to happen. We can't fix by ourselves what's broken, but you know the good news, obviously, and we hear it all the time, and I hope we don't ever get tired of hearing it, the good news is that what's broken in us, that what we can't fix by ourselves, God has fixed for us, right? Also in Paul's letters, he said, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because through Christ Jesus, 
The law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. And so we receive forgiveness. We receive life through Jesus' death and resurrection. We receive life and empowerment through the Holy Spirit in our lives. Everything that we are and everything that we do as Christians starts from that starting point. But one of the reasons the change is hard is that this side of the grave, we're never going to get rid of that sinful nature. And so it's always there. It's always fighting against us. And that's why Paul said what he did. You know, the good stuff I want to do, I don't do it. You know, and the stuff that I don't want to do, man, it just keeps coming back again and again and again. So that's one of the reasons that change is hard. But there are others. And now we get right into uh, the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, this is a kind of a farming analogy, but I I think you're smart enough to figure out and understand exactly what it is that he is talking about. One of the reasons that change is so difficult for us and it's so difficult to put our faith into action. He said, whoever watches the wind will not plant. And whoever looks at the clouds will not reap. That is both a very simple and a very profound observation. What he's really saying, isn't he? What he's really saying is that when there is a task before you, and especially if that task is challenging, or difficult, or unpleasant, or makes you uncomfortable, we can always come up with reasons not to do it, right? We can always come up with reasons and excuses why now's not the right time, or if only this happened, or if that situation changed, then it would be better, then it would be easier. I'll pick just one example from Scripture to help kind of exemplify that. Think about where the Bible tells us to love your neighbor as yourself. I mean, that's something we can all get behind, right? Probably something that we could all do better at, loving our neighbors as ourselves. But have you met my neighbors? And then, you know, and then the Bible says, you know, neighbors are not just the people living next to you. Those people are probably lovely people. But then, you know, neighbors, biblically, are everybody that we come into contact with. I mean, have you read the internet lately? I mean, you read the comment sections after any article, even if it was something about puppies and the evil, vile, hate-filled venom that comes out of these makes you want to lose faith in human nature. And you go, I'm going to love those people? I'm not so sure. That sounds pretty hard. And then, you know, I also read on the internet, I can't really love other people until I, I really love myself. So I think, you know what? I think it would be better if I just focus on myself and just focus on loving myself. And eventually I'll get around to maybe loving others and my neighbor. See how easy it is to make excuses? I guarantee you, those of you who know me, you could come up with a dozen things right off the top of your head that I could do better as a Christian. And I could easily come up with 50 reasons why you're wrong and why now's not the right time and and so on and so on and so forth. See, we can always come up with reasons and excuses. And I think maybe, and this is going to go one step farther, I think maybe one of the reasons we can always come up with reasons and excuses why now's not the time or maybe that change isn't necessary is because so many of the things that God calls us to do and calls us to be, if I'm being honest, they just don't make sense. You know what I mean? Think about this love your neighbor thing, right? Jesus uh, preached a sermon up on a mountainside. All these people were gathered before him. And he said, you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And we're going, yes, see Jesus, that makes sense. You know, be nice to people who are nice to you, right? That's easy. And people who identify as my enemy will have, of course I would want to hate them, maybe not really outwardly and vocally, but you know, deep inside for sure. I don't like that person. But see, Jesus turns that on his head, doesn't he? He said, you've heard it said, 
love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your Father in heaven. What? See now, again, to our way of thinking, that doesn't make sense, does it? I mean, if you open yourself up and show love to people who have identified as your enemies, people that don't like you, people that mistreat you, people that hate you, all you're doing is opening yourself up for more hating, right? If we put other people first, then we're always going to end up being last, aren't we? We're going to be everybody's doormat. People are going to walk all over us and abuse us and take advantages of. And so, you know, again, to our way of thinking, that that doesn't make any sense. And so if God calls us to do those things and God calls us to be those people, if that's what it means to be a child of God and we need to make changes to be that kind of person and it doesn't make sense, that makes change hard, doesn't it? So let's do a real quick recap. So we've already established that change is hard. Change is hard because we still have a sinful nature that fights against being what God wants us to be and doing what God calls us to do. Change is hard because a lot of times the changes that are necessary and that we're called for don't make sense to us and therefore we can always come up with excuses to not change. Is that about capture it? That's where we're at right now. So where, okay Dave, so where's, where's the good stuff, right? This is all kind of negative. Here it comes. Let's go back to the book of Ecclesiastes. See, the teacher drops a truth bomb in here. Listen to what he says. As you do not know the path of the wind or how the body is formed in a mother's womb, and keep in mind this was written thousands of years ago before meteorology and computer models and all 3D ultrasounds, people you know, different time. As you do not know the path of the wind or how the body is formed in a mother's womb, so you cannot understand the work of God, the maker of all things. That's a deep, deep truth right there. And so the question we need to ask ourselves as we contemplate change, as we contemplate doing the things that God calls us to do and being the people that God has called us to be as we contemplate that the question we need to ask ourselves is not does this make sense to me the question is not do I understand what God's doing here no the question we need to ask ourselves because we can't understand God you know the Psalms say my ways are not your ways my thoughts are not your thoughts as high as the heavens are above the earth so far are my ways above your ways we're never going to understand all of the ins and outs and the details of, of God's mind and how he works things in this world. And because we can't understand and we never will completely understand everything that goes on in life, the question we need to ask ourselves is, do you trust God? Do you trust God when he says, I've called you out of darkness into light that that you might be my people in the world and declare my praises. When you struggle with failure after failure, when you try to make changes, do you trust God when he says, you can change? And do you trust God when he says, you can change? Do you trust God when he says, these changes that I'm calling you to make are going to make your life better? And they're going to make the lives of all the people that you come into contact with better. And it's going to make this world a better place. Do you trust God when he calls us to make changes? And it just is hard. And we're in the midst of difficulties and, and things seem to be going sideways. Do you trust that God knows what he's doing? I can't answer that question for you. And I can't argue you into believing it either. What I can do is share a few thoughts. I'm going to go back to the Apostle Paul. Because, you know, he knows our struggles, right? The Apostle Paul was writing to the believers in the town of Rome. And these folks did not have an easy time of it. 
They had changed, many of them, from being complete, you know, full-on Roman citizens, worshiping all these make-believe gods and idols and stuff, to being Christians. That was not easy. And the changes that God was calling them to make to be his people in that place, that was tough. And so Paul wrote to them and encouraged them, and he said, He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? God was willing to give us his son. Jesus was willing to come into the world. We celebrate that, right? Just last week we celebrated Jesus coming into the world. If God was willing to do that for you, what is he not willing to do? Will he graciously give us all things? And then one last thought. Paul says, in those difficult times and in difficult situations and when you're just really struggling to be the person that God wants you to be in maybe really challenging conditions, he says, just keep this in mind, that nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Think of the Apostle Paul. He was willing to go to the ends of the earth. He was willing to endure prison and beatings and ultimately death. Why? Because he trusted that God knew what he was doing. And he trusted the direction that God had for his life. All I can do is share that with you. I can't do any better than that. And then the teacher concludes <clears throat> back in Ecclesiastes. Based on all of that, he gives us a call to action, right? He said, sow your seed in the morning, and at evening let your hands not be idle, for you don't know which one will succeed, whether this or that, or whether both will do equally well. Finally, he just says, man, stop overthinking it. Right? Stop procrastinating. You want to make change? You want to do the things that God calls you to do and be the people that God calls you to be? Then just do it. You don't have to understand how it's all going to work out. You don't have to understand how it's even possible. Just know and trust that with God, all things are possible. And trust that God will be with you in this coming year and will be walking with you and will be guiding and directing everything that happens in your life. Action. Action is the solution to the anal or the paralysis of analysis, right? And so, friends, we've got an exciting new year all laid out before us, a bunch of blank pages just waiting for us to fill it with the stories of our lives. We all have room for growth, opportunities for change. I pray that you will go forward into this new year with trust and confidence and hope that this year will be a good year with God. Amen.